The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, And have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. So a friend of ours often will invite us and a number of other families with young kids over to their house to play. And they have this great playroom where all the kids can go off and play and leave us, I mean, have their own space to go crazy. The thing about this space, however, is that one of the things in it is a kid-sized drum set. Now, I don't know whether they purchased it themselves in a moment of weakness, or whether someone who is now an enemy gave it to them as a gift, but there it was. Now, if you've ever met a kid, you know the first thing they are going to do upon seeing a drum set is play the drum set, especially when the sticks are sitting right there. So soon after the kids headed downstairs, we hear drumming, Symbols crashing, any other kind of banging that was physically, humanly possible. We tolerated, we enjoyed it for a while. But pretty soon, the owner of the house marched downstairs and came back upstairs with the drumsticks. The next time we showed up at their house, the drum set was still there, but it was now surrounded by one of those baby play yard fences. And all the kids just stood there at a distance looking at it. And I could imagine them thinking, what, didn't you like my playing? Why would you have a drum set there, a kid-sized drum set, and not expect the kids to play it? And not let the kids play it? I know there was good intention of having that kind of thing down there. You know, wanting the kids to develop an interest in music, teaching them rhythm and coordination. But then when it comes to actually hearing the drum set being played, it's a whole other story, right? I know these kinds of things are well-intentioned. It happens all the time, like receiving the gift of a harmonica or this spinny, rolling monster toy that would move faster and faster the louder you yell at it. True story. And you want your kids to have a chance to learn these skills or play with these toys, but sometimes you just end up putting your foot down and saying, let's try this another day. What, don't you like my playing? I mean, we we want to, we're trying to, but please, let's take a break and try it another day. Is that something like what Jesus is talking about in his gospel reading today? He says to the crowds, to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. 
What, you didn't like my drumming? You didn't like my harmonica playing? Just like any and all of Jesus' parables, this is going to take a little imagination and unpacking. So let's start by thinking where this story falls in Matthew's gospel. We've been hearing for the past many weeks that Jesus has been preparing his disciples to be sent out to spread the good news. And as we heard, Jesus also warns them about how challenging this work is going to be. So after Jesus finishes all this instruction, we hear in Matthew's gospel that Jesus goes on to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. So Jesus is out doing this work, and as he's out there, John, uh, disciples of John the Baptist, who's now in prison, his disciples come to Jesus on John's behalf, and they ask Jesus whether or not you are actually the one John was talking about. The things that Jesus has been doing and teaching, even John the Baptist wasn't sure if this was how it was supposed to be. So Jesus goes and tells John's disciples to go back and tell John what they see. There are people being healed and cleansed and given new life. So John's disciples leave to deliver that news. And Jesus then begins to tell the crowds just how great John the Baptist is. And how the things that he has prophesied about are indeed true. Let anyone with ears listen, Jesus says. Blessed are all who believe in this work that I'm doing. It's after Jesus makes these affirmations of this work that he shifts gears again. But to what will I compare this generation? What should I say about those who simply don't or won't believe in this work and that I came in God's name to do it? So many believe that in saying this generation, Jesus is referring to a specific type of group or people who aren't believing his message. So after he makes this comparison about the children in the marketplaces, Jesus then says, as we heard in the gospel, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say... Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So let's think back then. When John was preaching and baptizing in the wilderness, we hear that a group of Pharisees and Sadducees come to John while he's out there, and he turns and looks at them and shouts, You brood of vipers! Those Pharisees and leaders believed John was possessed because of this prophecy and because of how he was baptizing. Now fast forward, and just recently as we heard, after Jesus calls his disciples, he sits down to eat with them and invites tax collectors and sinners to eat with them. And if you remember hearing that story a few weeks ago, there was this group of people that witnessed this dinner, and they were upset about why Jesus would eat with these kinds of people. And again, that group was the Pharisees. So it is frequently assumed that this generation that Jesus is railing against is the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the ones with power who believe that they know what God is doing. They are the ones not dancing for children's music or or mourning at the children's lament. But then who are these children? Well, think back to last week when we heard the words of Jesus' welcome where he said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. Whoever welcomes a prophet or a righteous person will receive my reward. Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones will not lose their reward. In this conclusion to his teaching, Jesus was describing how his apostles would be welcomed which includes the little ones who would receive this cold water. They too were sent, they were ones who were sent in his name to proclaim his teaching. So if we look at this comparison that Jesus is making, we can say that Jesus' apostles were the ones playing music in a sense. They were bringing the good news, yet the so-called religious ones didn't want to hear it. 
Jesus' apostles wailed over the state of the world, yet the Pharisees were there thinking that everything was just hunky-dory. As we think about this comparison, I wonder, are we ones who are trying to proclaim the good news to a world that just won't listen? Or are we like the Pharisees who hear this good news of Jesus, which is often quite unsettling as we frequently hear, and think, well, that's not what my religion says, and brush it off? Or are we some of both? I always appreciate hearing this passage from Paul. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Anyone else ever feel like that? There are things that we want to do. There are things that we know we should do, but then we simply don't do them. It's like our bodies, our very beings, simply have this natural aversion to doing this countercultural work. Thinking back to my story earlier, I want my kids to learn instruments. I want them to be creative and have fun toys. I want them to expend energy. But when the moment for all of that comes, knowing full well that what they're doing is well and good, I still find myself saying, let's try this another day. But when I think about all the things that Jesus calls us to, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, caring for the sick and oppressed, welcoming the stranger and the alien, sitting down for a meal with those who are different from me, I know I should do those things. I know Jesus calls me to do those things. Heck, I even want to do those things. But when the opportunity arises... The sacrifice feels too much. And I do the thing I hate, retreating into my own comfort and passivity, acting like one of the Pharisees Jesus refers to and and hiding behind judgment and criticism. As Paul said, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. Or the times that I know and confess that Jesus is the Savior of the world and that it is God who shows mercy and love and forgiveness through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, yet I still will believe and act as if the world depends on me and my proclamation. I will act as if the church will fail without me. I will fall into the trap of thinking that I am the one that has power to save instead of the one who already did so. I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. After Paul discusses the law and sin in our flesh, how did he conclude this passage this morning? He said, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Like Paul, we too turn to our Lord, our teacher, our healer, and our Savior, Jesus. Because after weeks of hearing Jesus tell us how difficult this work is that he's sending us to, here he changes his tone and he says, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, And I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For the longest time when I thought about Jesus' yoke, I imagined one of those shoulder yokes that would allow one person to carry two things on either side of them more easily. And when I thought of that, Jesus says that while this work can be hard, he's here to help lighten that load for each of us. But then one day I remembered that a yoke is also a device that connects or yokes two animals together so that they can share the load of the work that they're doing. And suddenly with that image, I'm picturing Jesus right beside me, helping me shoulder this work, helping me shoulder my weariness and my brokenness. Suddenly I'm picturing all of us shouldering this work together, side by side, knowing that we are never alone, 
knowing that I am able to help someone when they cannot bear their load, and knowing that others are alongside of me when things are tough for me. And in all of it, knowing that we are in this kingdom work together. Amen.